Hi everybody and welcome to module six, part two, discriminant and logistic regression. So I wanted to create a chart to help you to understand the differences between discriminant function analysis, also known as discriminant analysis and logistic regression. So the key concepts are discriminant function analysis really does uh, create categories of things and whereas logic regression is an odds ratio. So with discriminant analysis, it's answering which group will this DV most likely belong to. Whereas with odds ratio, we're saying, hey, what's the likely chance that this case is going to belong to this group and what are the most important predictors? Sounds similar, but there are important differences. With discriminant analysis, we can, um, our independent variables can be continuous scaled or dummy variables. And then with logistic regression, our independent variables need to be continuous scaled or can be categorical. With our dichotomous, or excuse me, with our dependent variables, both of these, I'm actually gonna merge this, there we go. Both of these um, use a dichotomous or nominal dependent variable. So when do we use discriminant analysis versus logistic regression? Well, if our dependent variable is nominal and has more than two groups, we should probably use discriminant analysis but we're going to have to make sure that we have an appropriate sample size and that we have normality in order to run a discriminant analysis. If there's any chance that our sample is not normal, then we should result to logistic regression. Logistic regression is uh, what's gonna help us because it's much more robust against any type of deviations from normality, um, but it does require a larger sample size to be able to do what it needs to do. So this first case we're going to go through is uh, looking specifically at discriminant function analysis. Now this is sometimes called a MANOVA in reverse, but just like other uh, statistical tools we've used, you have predictor variables for independent and you have your groups as your dependent. And it's going to basically create a regression equation, but it's called a discriminant equation. And here is what it would look like. So you would have your predicted score plus your intercept plus your coefficient for your first uh, independent variable times whatever that score is, second coefficient and that score, et cetera. All right. So let's scroll on down because you guys can read through these notes. But um, some of the main things, like I said, your predictors need to be independent. The predictor variables should have a multivariate normal distribution and they should have equal variance across groups. They need to be mutually exclusive. So the groups need to be mutually exclusive. You can't have it where the person can be a member of both groups, both outcomes. And they need to be truly categorical. So yes, no, you know, group one, group two, jury one, jury two, whatever, but they have to be distinct and mutually exclusive. There needs to be linear uh, relationship, normality. You want to check for multicollinearity because we don't want our independent variables to be overlapping too much. So we might run a correlation matrix to see if our independent variables are overlapping because if they're overlapping significantly, um, then chances are we won't be able to really pull out the variance that, that each of those accounts for um, will have some overlap. Um, and then we need to check for um, outliers as well. I also wanted to really highlight this rule for discriminant uh, analysis and that is the smallest group, smallest number of cases that you have in your group must exceed the total number of predictor variables. So, and it's really recommended that it be at least five times the number of observations as the predicted variables. So that's one way to check your sample size. Here are the instructions for how you do discriminant analysis in SPSS, and we're going to actually run a practice example looking at an international air carrier and data on the employees who have three different job classifications, customer service, mechanics, or dispatchers, and the director 
of human resources wants to know if these three job classifications appeal to different personality types. So we've got our data set here, you can download it, and our independent variable is based off personality type, so an outdoorsy person, sociable person, conservative, and these are all continuous scale, so they're on a scaled number. And then we have our categorical, our job, which you can't be in all three of these, you can only be in one, so they're mutually exclusive. The research question is, can we predict the job? customer service, mechanic, dispatcher, a person works based on their interest in outdoor activity, sociability, and conservativeness. So let's go through our process. We're going to test for assumptions, test for significance, look at the strength of relationships, and look at the accuracy of our prediction model. So let me run ahead, go ahead and pull up SPSS. It's another thing I was doing. Let's go, here go SPSS. We want this data right here. All right, so we've got our different outdoors in our category, right? So the first thing that we are going to do is we are going to go to Analyze, Classify, and we're going to go to, oh, it won't stay on that, Discriminant. All right, and so what we're gonna do is we're gonna move our outcome variables to the grouping. That is our job, right? Oh, I see an error. You see how this has the little dots beside it, conservative? That means that that's nominal and that's actually supposed to be scaled. So let's go back out. We should always check our data and variable view anyway. So we are going to change this to scale. And jobs should be nominal because they're going to be in one of three categories, right? And ideally, we would identify what those jobs are going to be. So one is, I, let me check and make sure that I remember which one. I think, I'm pretty sure that's customer service. Yeah, customer service. So it should be labeled. So one for customer service, add two is going to be mechanic, and three is going to be dispatch. So then we do three for dispatcher, and we hit OK. So now we have our labels for our job, which is nominal. All right, so next up, we are going to run our regression analysis. So we go to analyze, classify, and discriminant analysis. Now, this looks right. So we're going to put outdoor and grouping. No, sorry, our outcome goes in there. So jobs go in there. And we are going to define the range. So there's one job is the customer service, two is mechanic, and three is the um, dispatcher. And then we're going to move the outdoor, the uh, social, and the conservative to the independent. And then we're going to go to descriptive to statistics. We're going to click on getting our descriptives. We want our means, our univariate ANOVAs, and our box M. And then within the function coefficients, we should choose fissures, which will tell us um, which variables help maximize our functions, and unstandardize, so we can get those for our formula. And then under matrices, we're going to choose within group correlations. We're looking at within the groups, how are they correlated. We'll hit continue. Go to classify. Under classify, we're going to go under prior probabilities and make sure all groups are equal, because in this case, most our groups are about equal. And then under display, we're going to choose summary table and leave out one out classification. Under um, use covariance, we'll have within groups. And under plots, we'll have combined groups so that it combines the groups and it'll create a combined histogram for two of the groups and if there's two groups because we have three groups it's going to create a scatter plot. All right and then we're going to hit continue. Under save we are going to check predicted group membership. Well you can actually check all so we can see what they all look like. There we go. All right so that is what we need to do. We're going to hit okay. 
and our outcome is going to come up over here. There we go. Now we have all of our tables. So let's talk about, because there's a lot of them, with all these tables. I love this one because it's an overlay, so it shows the different types. Um, but let's take a look at what all of these mean. I've already written some descriptions uh, about these, so we're just going to walk our way through those. All right, so here we go. So the first thing is our group statistics. So group statistics shows us our means. I can see there's definitely some difference here, right? Um, conservatives versus social for customer service, maybe a little less difference for mechanic, but still some. And then dispatch seems to be equally across the different personality types. So gives us descriptive, a way we can describe our data. We then look at our test of equality of group means, and this is did the groups have a significant difference across the predictor variable? So when I look at this, was there a significant difference? How do I determine that? Through Wilkes Lambda. The smaller the Wilkes Lambda is, the more important the discriminant model is going, or the independent variable is going to be to the discriminant. So we want our F scores to be significant, which they are. Now, because of the type of um, procedures and with us using three groups at a time, we need to do what's called a bone Ferroni adjustment. So using just a F or using a 5% significance level is really kind of like a misnomer. That would be true if we had one variable, but because we have three predictors here, we need to calculate for that. And the way we do that is we take the standardized 0.05 we divide it by three for the number of groups that we have, and that gives us a significance level of 0 0.0166, which we translate to be 0 0.17. And what we're looking for is we want this um, significance level to be appropriate here. So instead of basing this off whether or not this is less than 0.05, it needs to be less than 0 0.1 or 0 0.017. So in this case, they're all significant. Now, next, we're going to look at our pooled matrix. And as with a MANOVA, we want to have a moderate correlation between each one of our variables, but not like a super high correlation, which would indicate multicollinearity. So here we see the relationship between outdoor and conservative is very low at 0.2, but that's the cutoff. So as long as it's at 0.2 or higher, we can keep it. So anything, any of these variables, we want them to be between 0.2 and 0.9. So that's what we're using this to test is that there's enough relationship that we can look at creating a prediction equation, but there's not so much relationship that we can't distinguish the variables from each other. Next, we're going to look at the box test. And so for our box test, what we want to do is look at the rank that tells us indicates the number of variables. We have three. And then we need to look at, are these fairly equal? If they're fairly equal, then that's telling us this is a good model and we have homogeneity of the covariance matrix. We're going to then look at the box M plot and the box M plot if the significance of the box M plot is greater than 0 0.0001, then we can say that our group variance is equal. So we're testing for our assumptions here, right? And in this case, we have a significance level of 0 0.012. So we can make an assumption that we have multivariate, multivariate normality, uh, which is a good thing. We want that. Here we have our eigenvalues. And with those, we want to make sure that these are um, that they're higher, that they're larger. The larger they are, the more variance the individual functions will explain in the dependent variable. So let me explain to you what the functions are. So functions are kind of like models in multiple regression in that function one is going to be a group or a variable that most explains the variance in the dependent variable. Now, once we've done that model, we then put all the other variables back in and say, okay, now control for the variables that were in that function one and see what variance can be explained by the rest of them. And we keep doing that 
until we have explained as much of the variance in our dependent variable as we can. So functions are directly correlated with the number of groups that you have. So in this particular group, I only have three groups, so I can only have two functions. So it's k minus one. So the number of groups minus one is the number of functions that I can have. Okay. Now, we also have a correlation here. This correlation right here is basically an effect size. It's a measure of association between the discriminant function and the dependent variable. So this is saying that in this particular case, when we look at this formula here, that our canonical correlation is equal to 0 0.721 to square. That gives us a partial at a square. So when I square this, I can say that this squared equals 52%. So 52% of the variance in job category is explained by the variables that are part of that function one, which we'll see in a minute. After I control for function one, I can then look at function two and I understand that I can square this and I determine that 24% of the remaining variance is accounted for by function two. This Wilkes uh, lambda here is a measure of unexplained variance. So the smaller, the greater the discriminatory factor the larger it is, then we can make it statistically significant. So these are very small significances for our Wilkes Lambda, which says that we have a very good discriminatory model. These are our, oh, the chi-square. Let's not forget about chi-square. So we have chi-square here. This is the chi-square, which is an amazingly significant chi-square. It's very big. Um, so is this one actually. Um, so the chi-squares here are significant and they describe the difference across our different functions. Like it, with each model, it's getting better and better. All right, with our standardized discriminant coefficients, this is where we're getting our coefficients to start building our model. And in function one, you can see that social sociability has the highest correlation, even though it's a negative. That do, that indicates the direction of correlation, but the 83.1 indicates the magnitude. So in this model, we have sociability and conservative. And in function two, outdoor, which makes sense because these two were in the first, control, it explains most of the variance using the second function. Now, one of the things we wanna make sure is that our standardized canonical discriminant function coefficients really aligns with the structural matrix, which is the next one. And if we look, we can see while different numbers, we're getting the same results. Social is the highest here. Conservative is the second highest as it is here. Here we have outdoor being the strongest. And again, outdoor is here. So different numbers, but same results. And that's all explained here. Now I will say that if any of your um, loadings, which is what this is called, by the way, loadings. If any of these loadings are less than 0.3, you want to throw it out. So like these guys wouldn't be anything we would use. All right. And also remember that when you see this asterisk in any of your SPSS charts, that's saying this is a significant finding. So significant, 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 not, not, not. Okay. Then we go, and this is how you could write those results right here. Then we go to our function coefficients. So now we have the intercept involved in this. So this is the constant or the intercept. And this is how we will build our discriminatory uh, prediction equation. So our discriminant function is the constant 0 0.937 plus the coefficient for outdoor, which is right here, right? From model one or from function one minus the coefficient of social plus the coefficient of conservative. Okay, so that makes our model here uh, so that we can break out that particular uh, function. I think. Social, conservative, outdoor. So actually, I made a mistake here. This should be 
0.225 because this one is coming from function two and these are coming from function one. All right, so you always have to check your work. All right, now we have um, centroids, which help us know what our cutoffs are for making our prediction equation. What does that mean? Well, when we're doing discriminant analysis, it means that if we are 50% or more certain that something's going to happen or we think that it's going to happen, we put it into the category we think it's going to happen, even if we're only at 50%. So the centroids help us calculate those. And then we also have the prior probabilities, and these are um, how we determine the membership in the groups. All right, so this is uh, all checking. So this is what we expect to find, and this is what we actually found. And here is our um, breakout for our classification coefficients. And this is how we're going to classify our cases, and it's going to give us what's called a classification results. And in our classification results, what we're interested in is, okay, this is what we originally thought was going to happen, and here's what actually happened. So predicted group, this is, we predicted them to be in each of these groups, and this is where they actually fell. So we predicted that 82.4 of these, uh, percent of these individuals based on their um, preferences on outdoor social and um, conservatism, we predicted that they would be customer service and they were in fact customer service. There was 12.9% of the mechanics though that were not, we thought they would be mechanics, but they were actually in customer service. And then there was 44.7% of the dispatch that we thought would be in dispatch were actually in customer service. So when we have what's called a false negative, so when we, uh, when we guesstimate something like here and here, and it was not, it was false negative. So yeah, this is a false negative. So here we have, these are the false negatives and so that is the part that we falsely predicted and so that's going to be called sensitivity our false positives are specificity so when we thought it was going to be one thing and it ended up being another that would be a false positive that's a little confusing but false negatives should have been positive but it was we thought it was going to be a negative and it wasn't and this is when we thought it was going to be a positive we predicted it right and it wasn't and then we're going to note that 75 percent of all of our original cases were correctly classified with this model so that piece of information right there is really important so we have with the combination of the two functions we correctly classified 82.4% of the customer service employees, 66.7% of the mechanics, and 77.3% of the dispatchers based on their interest in outdoor activity, sociability, and conservativeness. And overall, it was 75% correct. These are your charts, but you can also have like the one that I did for our results here, where you have them called overlay. I like the overlay when I'm looking at variables because then I can see how they're related to each other. You can see there's a little bit of overlap, but overall there's some pretty distinct patterns here for each type of profession. So it's kind of nice to do the overlay so you can see those together. So that is discriminant analysis and I have a bunch of resources for you that I hope that you will take advantage of and we will do logistic regression next.